I always try and go back to my why. And I, the interesting thing was when we started the company, I didn't have a very strong why. So like a year and a half ago, I did a digital whiteboard with digital sticky notes. And I was like, what is my why? And I just, I wrote down everything that I could possibly imagine. I came back two days later and I deleted it all. I was like, well, that was, and the one reason I didn't put on there, and I, it took me a, a lot of time to think about this is ultimately, why am I doing it? And I'm doing this, um, my why is, is doing this for my family. I'm absolutely passionate about the space. I'm absolutely passionate about the industries we help. I love um, and am blown away every day by their dedication, our customers. Um, but at the end of the day, why do I come back? And it's because I have that why and that why is around the most important thing in my life and that's my family. Hey everybody, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Growth. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups in the seven and eight figure businesses, as well as a founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great guest on the podcast, Colby Tunick. And uh, Colby, we're going to be talking about the growth that's been going on uh, for the business for the last uh, several months and uh, or for a last while now, um, including uh, how they've achieved 300 uh, percent year over year growth and uh, has also been uh, completing some accelerators and tripled the number of people using their software and uh, tried some things and failed some or uh, failed on some things with uh, growing the team and figuring that out is uh, as well as exploring uh, hiring an outside development shop. So. With that much as an introduction, welcome on the podcast, Colby. Thanks, Dad. I'm wonderful to be here again. Hey, excited to have you on. So as as you may have caught from Colby, so he's been on uh, a few of the uh, sister podcasts to this podcast, both the Inventive Journey, the Inventive Expert, and the Inventive Founder. So you, if you want to start with his journey and uh, follow it along, go back to the Inventive Journey and uh, and uh, and uh, catch up uh, throughout his journey. Um, but for those that haven't had a chance to catch up on your uh, previous podcasts and uh, and uh, get to know you a little bit, give us a quick introduction to yourself. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, I, I almost feel like we've grown up on these podcasts. So one of these days, <laughs> I will go back and watch our journey and be like, wow, did I really say that? But uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to watch those other episodes, my name is Colby Tunick, and we started this journey in September of 2019, perfectly timed it for a global pandemic. At the time, we didn't necessarily know what our focus was, but we knew that what we wanted to do was help companies create deeper and more meaningful connections with them between them and their customers. And where we ended up actually doing that was in the insurance industry, um, more specifically helping them retain their policyholders. So it's been an exciting time, and we're we're growing quite rapidly now, which is, you know, nice to report back on that. Hey, it's always better to be growing than shrinking. So that's awesome that you guys are able to to find that growth and to, to find that sweet spot. So so now diving in just a little bit and, you know, as, as uh, the audience is aware and is, as I mentioned with you, the inventive growth is really kind of catching up and what's been happening the last several months with the business, things you've learned, mistakes you've made, things that have been exciting, things that have been terrible, anything or all or all in between. Uh, but one of the things that uh, you'd mentioned a bit uh, before we uh, or before the podcast was uh, that uh, you guys have been uh, growing quite a bit. I think you've got, what, 300 percent year over year growth, which is a great trajectory to be on. So. Walk us through a little bit about uh, what you've been doing to uh, achieve that growth. Yeah, something about our industry that's worth noting is that we have very long sales cycles. The average sales contract for where we sit in the insurance space is at minimum 9 to 12 months, more so 16 to 18 months. And so a lot of our growth now has to do with the legwork we've done over the past two years, as well as how we've not only matured the technology, but how we've talked about it really propelling us forward, though we've been through two accelerators. It's funny saying propelling us forward and then saying accelerators in a in a following sentence, one being the Global Insurance Accelerator and then the other one being Broker Tech Ventures, both of which has you know, been phenomenal opportunities to really just raise awareness about the importance of what we're doing, how it works, and also help us as a founding team, uh, myself and my co-founder, Dr. Nassar Underwall, 
really understand how to talk about it, how to build processes that are scalable, and how to actually grow as a company. I think it's something that it, when you're starting a company, perhaps I had the mindset of, well, we'll just figure out how to grow when we're there. But then when you're actually trying to grow, it's really difficult. And we didn't give it much uh, forethought because not only did it take us a long time to get there, but I know for every company, what that growth looks like looks different. So now let me uh, follow that up because I think, you know, one of the hard things, I think regardless of the industry, but specifically or even specifically in yours is when you have those long growth cycles, one thing is it's hard to sustain the company long enough to realize that growth. In other words, if it takes 12, 18, 24 months, whatever that is to, uh, you know, to start getting uh, really see a lot of people come on board or getting those sales cycles. Some people, if the business doesn't have the wherewithal or the ability to stay alive that long, then you're going to have a difficult time. So how did you guys, as you're growing and as you're now realizing that, rewinding just a little bit, how did you guys kind of anticipate or, or plan for that being a longer or sales cycle that now you guys are reaping the rewards? But how did you how did you do that over a period of time? Yeah, well, I think first of all was the fact that when myself and the, the people I founded the company with started the company, we didn't immediately raise outside capital, which comes with the expectation that you'll need to re raise more capital upon certain milestones. And the other thing we didn't do immediately was quit, quit our day jobs. Hmm. And I think that there's an expectation out there, especially from uh, venture capitalists that fund companies, that unless you are 100% full-time on your startup, your, your, your baby, your dream, you're not actually committed. And... For me, I don't know how much I agree with that logic only because of exactly what you just mentioned, if you have 36 months to, to revenue or growth or traction, unless you've had a very successful career and you have significant savings in the bank, which I don't know, but most startup founders I speak with, that isn't their situation. You have to figure out a way to, to bootstrap it as long as possible. The second thing we did, and this is more practical on a sales side is uh, we learned early on that the number of deals we had in our sales funnel weren't sufficient to get to the growth goals we wanted. So after speaking with some trusted advisors, you know, we've been for the last year and a half trying to get as close to 3x pipeline mm -hmm. coverage as possible so that if a deal falls through or something takes longer, you know, it's not materially affecting our, our growth and our health. So that both of those things, I think, have been key contributors to our growth. No, and I think that uh, that makes sense and sounds like uh, you guys are anticipated and planned for that, which is, I think, another thing is to have that realization, hey, if that's what our growth cycle is going to be, if that's what it's going to take, let's make sure we set it up. And whether that's not taking investor dollars too early on, whether that's, you know, keeping the the day job, so to speak, or otherwise getting things in place so that you can have that runway to uh, make it success. Now, as you guys have seen the growth, or I guess I'm going to back up. I was going to ask one other question. I'll also hold that for a second. But the other thing that I thought was interesting is you guys continue to go through accelerator programs, which I think is great. You know, a lot of times or people, I think they have the idea that Hey, accelerator is really pre-launch. It's getting you know some excitement, getting some training, getting some mentorship, and then once you launch, you don't do it anymore, so to speak. And so, walk mm -hmm. us through a little bit as to what was those accelerators? How did you lever that leverage them? How did you find them, and kind of how they've been beneficial to the company? Yeah, and having gone through these accelerator programs, it's interesting because we were on the later stage of already having some revenue and. At the time when we were going through the interview process, speaking with you know the managing directors of some of these programs, they were very transparent that they thought we may be too far along for them to help. Hmm. Because there, there, there becomes a certain point where you don't actually benefit much from the sort of entrepreneurship 101. And while that's foundational, at least how we articulated our involvement in these programs, it wasn't necessarily for that. We had already... Um, you know, identified a pain point. We had already brought on some revenue around that pain point. We were looking to figure out though, how do we take this from a small team and grow the team? How do we take this from a handful of companies and leverage that success to bring on more sales? And so we were able to, with the help of the program staff who, you know, bent over backwards to, to just help any way they could, rather than kind of teach us the basics, it was more like, how do we now 
do a crash MBA course for these folks so that they can take a, a small team to a big team, handful of customers to, to a lot of customers and build scalable, repeatable processes around that. And so for us, it was beneficial, might not have been a good fit for everyone. No, and I, I like that. because I like the the approach because, I mean, I think sometimes you think, oh, the company's up and going. We have a customer or two. Now we're set. We're good to go. We don't need any more guidance or mentorship. And usually that's when you hit a, not just that time, but you hit the, the hard part, which is now how do we grow? How do we scale? How do we make this, you know, kind of, or how do we become real boys, so to speak? And how do we actually grow up as a company and, you know, you can figure that out along the way, but if you can get that ongoing mentorship and and get that ongoing guidance, it can, uh, as you guys uh, are a testament to, uh, can helpful be helpful in the in the growth of the business. So now I'll jump to the question, which is what I was originally going to ask before I re rewound, which is so now you know one of the things that can be difficult with the company is you are going in that growth cycle and you're bringing on more customers and bringing on more clients is. How do you bring on the right team members or do you bring on team members and how do you grow and how do you service all those clients and how do you make sure that the systems or programs or things you have in place can grow with those, uh, you know, with those that growth of the company and with the customer. So walk us through a little bit is, you know, was it all smooth sailing and he just brought everybody on? It was perfect and he grew and uh, you had more customers and more revenue and it was awesome. Did you fall flat on your face and have to pick yourself back up or somewhere in between? Uh, a lot of falling flat on our face. I think when we began, we were overly optimistic. Something that was, and it's still hard for me to just be transparent. Uh, there's a quote I really like, and it's sometimes in order to grow the business, you can't be you can't be working in the business. You have to be working on the business. Hmm. Like you can't be in the business. You have to be working on the business. And when what they mean is when you're in the business, you're you're sort of doing the day to day. You're managing the emails. You're working directly with customers. Your head is down. When you're working on the business, you're sort of thinking broader picture, company values, where you fit in the market, what category are you trying to build? How are you differentiating yourself from a larger field? And so what we the mistakes we made around growing the team were the fact that we were doing that originally from the working in the business. Mm. And we didn't put the foundation in place that we should have. We didn't have the conversations around how do we want to, like, how do we actually want to do this? What are the pros and cons of all of these different options out there? How do we make sure that if, even if we're bringing on a consultant or an outside contracting firm, a dev shop, if you will, you know, they they understand our values and they're meeting those values. Mm. And as soon as we did that, there was a remarkable change in not only how successful we were being with that approach, but the quality of the work that was being done. No, make makes sense. And uh, it, I think everybody gets those moments where you feel or whether or not you really fall flat on your face, it certainly feels like it or you have to uh, navigate or adjust or otherwise pivot in order to to figure things out along the way, because even, no matter how much accelerator programs, how much mentorship, how much experience you have as a founder, any or all the above. You still don't know everything, and every time you go through it, it's a different. It's a different scenario, and so I think that some of those you just have to learn, uh, learn and grow with the, as the business grows along with you. So, so one of the other things you mentioned is, you know, an outside development shop. You know, how did you decide between growing the team internally, doing it yourself, outside development? Was it just needing something now, or they had the expertise or the experience, or it was a, a short term project or kind of walk us through a little bit of how you came to that uh, conclusion or, or that determination? Yeah. So primarily what we've used outside shops for are sort of standalone widgets. Maybe they get bolted on to the, the rest of the product, but it's something that can be defined and tested and implemented and built by itself without a deep understanding of what's going on with everything else. And so we thought in order to just increase our, our speed to market, hiring some extra hands to help with that would be a valuable use of our of our limited resources. The, the other component of that was when we were looking at what it would cost to hire you know, a full-time employee or even a part-time employee, whether that be in the U.S. or or near shore. You know, after a couple of conversations with different folks, we realized we would have to spend around forty thousand dollars to just do a trial period mm. with them, just just to see if they're a good fit, just to see if they can actually deliver what we would ask them to. And you know, for over a three or four month mark, which unfortunately just isn't you know 
are, are not resources we have to just try to see if someone's a good culture fit. So while our long-term intention is to hire people directly and be their employer, it just didn't make sense in the in the short term when we also looked at it from the lens of here's a standalone widget. Once it's built, anyone can maintain it. That's how we that's how we went about that decision making process. No, that makes sense. And I know I think sometimes people are too quick to jump to, hey, let's bring on a whole bunch of people. We're growing, we're expanding, let's bring on a whole bunch of people. And, you know, sometimes that's the right decision. Not, I'm not saying it's not right, but sometimes you also get into, does it make sense for the the or the or period where the business is at? In other words, yeah, it'd be awesome if we had unlimited funds, we'd bring everybody on, train them up. But even that you have to, you know, they have to get the culture, they have to have the training, they have to have the experience, and then you still have to be able to keep them busy and feed them work. And so they're not just sitting on there after they fin build something or they finish something. And so I think that, you know, it's kind of that build versus buy. And I get this isn't quite the buy, but as they're having the development shop or assist in that, I think makes a lot of sense. And so it sounds like it was a, a good decision. Now, I think you also did mention that you did bring on or you were looking to and uh, had, you know, I don't know, fell on your face or uh, made some missteps or, or learning opportunities. We'll call it that. Um, with uh, bringing people on or, or deciding, you know, when do you as founders, do you reach the end of your bandwidth? How do you determine when to bring someone on or when to not and let some things go or not let some things go? So walk us through as you guys were growing, how, you know, kind of how that played out. Yeah, we had a lot of conversations that they were on the flavor of, do we grow now in order to expand or do we wait to, ex do we expand to grow? Like, do you, do you bring on employees to, fund, to to be able to support the growth or do you just grow? Mm. And then once you have the revenue, you bring on the people. And I don't know if there's ever a good answer. What I will say is we tried both. Um, we initially started with, well, let's just go hire somebody. Like, let's just go find a full-time employee who can do this work. And what we actually ran into was an issue where we needed about five different skill sets. Right? There wasn't enough work for someone with one skill set to do one thing all the time. And so after spending many, many hours that maybe not wasted because we learned something, but maybe, you know, we're not necessarily productive. We, we found that actually that approach wouldn't work because we actually needed to hire at least three people. Well, that's, you know, unfortunate if you only have the funds for one and just it's never a good bet if you're trying to hire one person to do a million different things, all of which they're 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 sort of shallow or more superficial expertise with. Um, so then we're like, okay, well, let's just go hire a consulting firm. So we did. And then we made the mistake of of not holding them accountable to deadlines. And you know, at the time it started with, oh, you know, my my spouse is in the hospital and they're sick. And it's like, okay, so yeah, we'll we'll push it back a couple of days. And then it just snowballed from there and unfortunately we didn't hold ourselves as accountable as we should have and um it was it, it was much more difficult at the time than in hindsight it should have been to just end the contract and, and source someone else mm. and you know having stumbled on both approaches i don't you know I, i'd love to know if there's a more elegant way to do it but uh, where we've since settled is let's just let's get the help we need um for the amount of help we needed. And then once there's no more work, we, we move on to a different consultant who can, you know, support us there. And we'll keep what we learned in mind though, for when we go back and just try to hire again. No. And I think that, you know, that we're, and it's hard. And I would almost say it's the same thing with employees, right? So whether it's an outside developer, contract worker, one is, is you know, at least in my experience, now I'm infusing or my, my mistakes into the conversation, which is, you know, for me, it was, especially when I started out and I've, I've learned to say, those sub, say lessons is I always felt like, and it was a bad, I don't know, bad mistake. It was a good learning experience, which is everybody's going to work as hard as I am, but everybody's going to do as good a job and everybody's going to care as much about the business as I do. And it's not the case. And it's it's not faulting people. You know, if you're the owner, if you're the person that's put it, your blood, sweat and tears, you've had to do this as a side hustle, you put in your own money, you're going to care a lot more about it. You're going to work a lot harder and it's going to mean a lot more to you. And so you have to, I think one of the things that you learn, especially with, as you get started is everybody doesn't have that perspective and it's okay, but you also have to, you know, make that realization. And then it becomes okay. Now, 
as I hold people accountable, are these the people that while they're not going to have that same perspective, they are going to have the good work ethic. They're going to get things work done and they're going to meet timelines and they're going to be responsive. And so, yeah, that I don't know of any shortcut of the whether it's employees, independent contractors, outside people, inside people. It's just one where you have to gauge and find the right people. And it usually takes a period of time. And it also takes a, a period of time for you to to learn the lessons as to what to watch out for and, and when or when to cut the cord and when not to. So. Yeah, we, we well, also that, made the mistake where we let people subcontract. Mm -hmm. We hire someone with one skill set and they missed a piece of like, we'll go find someone to do this work for us. Looking back, we would have rather paid more money to one person who could have done both tasks. Not sure how relevant that is to the audience, but if you're ever in that situation, don't save the hundred dollars. It'll cost you more in the long run. I I, I think that's a great uh, great uh, takeaway or piece of advice. So, well, now as we've kind of caught up about you know what you've been doing the last six months, where you've headed, growth you've seen, mistakes you've made, places you've fallen on your face, places where you've done excelled and done awesome, and everything in between. Uh, now I'm going to ask, you know, kind of if you were to now project out the next six to 12 months, kind of where you see things headed, what's next to, or in the pipeline or where do you see things going, kind of or clue us in or where do you see or where where's the next steps going for you? Yeah, this will be our a, a year from now. Our hope is to have an actual team, uh, you know, of full time staff that are doing the work, developers, account executives and the like. Uh, and also to to continue to 300 times our revenue each and every year. So, you know, next year that will put us right around half a million dollars in, in ARR uh, and continue growing from there. We've had wonderful, um, we've, we've had a really wonderful time with our current customers referring us to to new customers. And we're exciting to see that continue to, to, to happen organically and if you were to ask me where we are 12 months from now, I would say probably the majority of our growth would be that organic growth. Mm. No, I think that's hot. And I, I love organic growth. It's 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 always easier to it's it's great if you can find it. And it's always harder to find, and you know, in the sense that you know, the one that is always uh, feels like the get rich quick scheme is not a get rich quick scheme, or but it's it's usually just hey, we'll go spend a whole bunch of money on advertising, Google ads, or anything else, or email blasts, or anything. And I'm not saying those aren't don't have their place, but if you can find a place to where it's organic growth, to where it's naturally progressing and and coming along, that's where it, it seems to to reach that more sustainable nature. And so I think that's awesome that uh, you guys are are heading in that direction and able to to continue to find it. So. Well, now as as we do rat or reach towards kind of the the catch up and also where you're headed, uh, great time to to ask the one, the question I always like to ask at the end of each episode. Um, so you know I've talked about this in previous episodes, but when you're in a business, there's always periods of time, especially when you fall flat on your face, when you make a mistake, when things aren't going well where you just get worn out with the business. And it's just one where it doesn't matter. At some point along the business, probably multiple times along the business, you get worn out. And it's not that you want to, you know, just simply, simply stop or quit, or sometimes you do want to stop or quit, but you have to figure out what do I do in those periods where it's not fun or it's not easy and it gets hard and you get worn out. How do you continue forward? So the question I like to ask is when you do get worn out with your business, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, I take a nice hot shower. I might be a very short-term fix, but what, uh, you know, having hit this a couple of times now, I always try and go back to my why. And I, the interesting thing was when we started the company, I didn't have a very strong why. So like a year and a half ago, I did a digital whiteboard with digital sticky notes. And I was like, what is my why? And I just, I wrote down everything that I could possibly imagine I came back two days later and I deleted it all. I was like, well, that was, and the one reason I didn't put on there, and I, it took me a, a lot of time to think about this is ultimately why am I doing it? And I'm doing this. Um, my why is, is doing this for my family. I'm absolutely passionate about the space. I'm absolutely passionate about the industries we help. I love um, and am blown away every day by their dedication, our customers, um, but at the end of the day, why do I come back? And it's because I have that why and that why is around the most important thing in my life and that's my family. Mm. So when someone is getting to that burnout, I would say to remember your why. Now, there might be people listening to this podcast that realize that their why doesn't align with what they're doing. 
And in that case, sometimes it's difficult because you have all of this sunk cost, not only financially, but time, resources, and, and opportunity. And not that whenever someone encounters a hardship, they, they should you know, back down. But it, it I have seen many uh, successful founders realize what they started doing wasn't aligned with what they wanted to do. They stop. They they take the they take the temporary L and then they come back way better because they've learned a tremendous amount that they can apply to something they genuinely care about. Whether or not that's a, a hobby, a passion. I know someone right now who's building an app to connect sports fans, right? And it's like the greatest thing under the sun for them because it's something that they themselves are passionate about. Mm. Um so that uh, perhaps a long-winded way to say remember your why. No, I think that's a great one. And I, I think it, you know, if, if I were to infuse one or my or my perspective as well, is it can't just be money. In other words, everybody thinks if I start my business, I'm going to be rich. And that's the only thing I care about. Well, it's not bad to, to make a lot of money with the business, but it doesn't carry you through. And because there's a lot of ways you can make money, you can go out, you can work for someone else, you can, you know, start your own business, you can go get a lot of education, you can, I mean, money in and of itself, I don't think carries you. But if you can remember some of the whys that do are long and sustaining and matter, then you're going to be able to work through those uh, periods and family is a great one. And I, I, I totally agree with you. That's a, a great one to, to help you to remember. And so I, I think that uh, finding that why is definitely beneficial. Well, before we wrap up the episode, one of the other things that uh, Colby and Refox AI have done is they've uh, sponsored a, a water bottle giveaway. I love to do it because uh, one is I just like the water bottles. I think they're fun and they're, they're you know, I always look at like it feels like when they're the, the cheap swag and they're just the crappy water bottles that people printed on the side. I'm like, well, those go in the garbage. And so that's why we, and we do it. We do just the opposite. We do very nice water bottles. I get to engrave or I got a design and we engrave them actually here at the at the, the office. And so it makes it fun and personalized as, as we do each water bottle. So with that as a big wind up for uh, for the giveaway, um, you know, if people want to find out or, or sorry, if they want to get the water bottle, we, we give away five with the episode. So the first five people to come and grab them are the ones that get them. Um, so what you do is you go to our website, you go under our, uh, our entrepreneurial gear, grab a water bottle and use a promo code. So I'm going to turn it over to Colby to share what the promo code is. Yeah, the promo is refocus now, R-E-F-O-C-U-S-N-O-W. All right. One word is uh, put that all together, refocus now, put it in as a promo code and you get an awesome entrepreneurial water bottle that I love giving away because it makes it all, all the more fun to, to celebrate uh, your journey. So with that, now as we are wrapping up, if people want to reach out to you, they want to learn more about Refocus AI, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? Yeah, send me an email. Uh, Obi at refocusai.com. Love to hear from you. All right. Simple and easy. Send an email and you can get in touch with Colby, uh, support a great business and if, if nothing else, make a new best friend. So with that, thank you again, Colby, for coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. Now for all of you that are listeners that are out there, if you can make sure to click share, subscribe and leave us a review helps us so we can reach even more startups and small businesses to help them along their journey to success. And on that note, if you ever need help with your patents or your trademarks or anything else along your journey, reach out to us. Just go to strategymeeting.com. Grab some time with us to chat. We're always here to help. Thank you again, Colby, and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Absolutely. See you again.